Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another book review on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are taking a look at U.S. Aerial Armament in World War II by William Wolfe. This is actually part one of a three-part book, and it's like 425 pages on its own. Uh, part one here is Guns, Ammunition, and Turrets. Part two is Bombs and Bomb Sites, and part three is Missiles and like Secret Special Weapons. Um, Mr. Wolf has previously written a number of books on U.S. military aircraft, and apparently decided that uh, he had a whole bunch of information that he had collected in the course of doing those on specifically the armaments of U.S. aircraft in World War II, and he thought that would be a an interesting and suitable book to do, and I would very much have to agree. I think this is one of those places that's very much overlooked by a lot of people. The idea of everyone kind of knows that, yeah, airplanes had guns in them, but what were those guns? There are a lot of technical requirements for aircraft armament that are very different from ground armament. So even when the guns are kind of at their core the same, like the Browning 30 caliber and the Browning 50 caliber guns, there's a lot that goes into making them actually work in an aircraft, where you're very high up, you're very at very, very cold temperatures. In fighters in particular, you're, you're looking at um, G-forces acting on the guns while they're trying to feed and cycle that you would never even have to conceivably think about for a ground gun. How does that impact, say, the, the requirement to pull a belt into a gun, if you've got multiple Gs that might be pulling with the belt or might be pulling against it? In addition, a lot of armaments went, well, a ton of armaments went well beyond 50 caliber, and aircraft cannon are very much an underappreciated and underexplored and under understood uh, area of firearms technology. So there was quite a lot of development of cannons in the 15 millimeter, 20 millimeter, 23 millimeter, 37 millimeter, 75 millimeter. Um, that all went on during World War II. In fact, the United States is kind of the oddball out in sticking primarily to 50 caliber machine guns when most of the other countries substantially involved in the air war, in particular Britain and Germany, uh, spent a lot of time working on and equipping their aircraft with cannons. So uh, this is in an incredibly densely packed book of information. Um, and it's divided into a number of different sections in here. In fact, we'll go ahead and uh, let me just go through these for you. Part one is aircraft machine guns, two is aircraft cannon, three is ammunition, four gun sights, gun cameras, and radar. Now there is an area that is generally not well understood by most people. Uh, central fire control and remote sighting, bomber armament, uh, followed by of course fighter armament, a section on gunnery training, night fighter and bomber, uh, air-to-air -air strafing and gunnery tactics, and then an overview of U.S. Uh, air aircraft capabilities and armaments through the war. Now, while this says World War II aircraft armaments, in reality this book actually goes back to World War I in a lot of places. So uh, when discussing, say, the Browning 30 caliber guns, this covers everything back to the very beginning of U.S. aerial weaponry, talking about um, the, for example, the early use of Lewis guns. When you talk about turrets, he talks about the development from the original like scarf rings in World War I. A lot of the interwar development, in fact, a, a ton of what's in this book is actually interwar development that was eventually utilized during World War II and then improved upon. So there's a lot of that information. Don't think that this is just focused on the handful of guns that were actively used during World War, World War II. There's a lot of prior information in there. Um, in addition, despite the fact that this is specifically titled U.S. aerial armament, there's also a lot of discussion of other countries' arms, because a lot of the there was a lot of experimentation that went back and forth between the U.S. and other countries. So, some of the 20 millimeter cannons were projects that the British were involved in as well, and there's a lot of discussion of those. Um, there's discussion of um, some, for example, the Japanese aircraft armament as well as German cannons in particular. Uh, especially some of the cannons like the MG 151-20 that was uh, that the U.S. attempted to copy. So it is actually a book that covers a lot more than just the scope of the title might lead you to believe. Now there are some typographical issues, there are a few little editorial goofs in it, but overall this is just a massive trove of information. There are very few other books out there on aerial armaments. Um, there are a couple by Anthony Williams that are good, uh, and they cover a wider scope 
than this, but not as much depth. So uh, if you're really into aircraft armaments, I'm sure you'll have both. If you're not quite so interested in it, but you would like a good overview of how all this stuff worked, this is a fantastic book, especially the sections on things like turrets and radar and gun sights. These are elements that people generally don't think about, and there's actually quite a lot of mechanical, like interesting mechanical stuff going on there. You know, just the evolution from a simple ring sight um, earlier, like World War I vein sights, where you actually have a front sight on a machine gun that is designed to interact with the slipstream around the aircraft and kind of do the calculation for providing lead based on airspeed by itself and automatically. Some of that stuff I find just fascinating. And then I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate just how much electronic warfare really was being used in World War II. And that's covered in here, along with really the development of aerial electronic warfare in total. So um, the cover price on the book is 70 bucks. It's printed by Schiffer. So I have a link in the description text below where you can find this uh, on Schiffer's website. You can also find it on Amazon. When I looked on Amazon, it was basically uh, list price on there as well. So whichever is your preference, it's available on both. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there are two other follow-up volumes. I don't have those. I haven't read them. I can't really comment on them. My personal interest is in the firearms specifically. So this is this first volume on the guns and their accessory equipment was the one that was particularly interesting to me. So um, I think uh, I think this would actually be interesting to quite a lot of people who may not actually think that this is a book that they would be interested in. So not something you're going to read cover to cover. I can pretty much guarantee it. This is a flip through bit to bit pick something that interests you today and read through that section, or pick something that you want to find out more about, like if you're going to go visit your local aircraft museum. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Stick around tomorrow for some more cool forgotten weapons.